Welcome back. Our top stories this hour, OPEC ministers are talking about putting the squeeze on oil production. They are holding an emergency meeting today in Vienna, Austria, to discuss a 2.3% cut in the global oil output. The goal is to turn around a depressed market. Other major oil producers outside of OPEC are also pledging cuts. Oil prices increased $2 a barrel since that decision was announced March 22nd. Oh, okay. Then, uh, Just in then it's Investor Education Week. The Ontario Securities Commission wants you to become a smarter investor. Information sessions are being held throughout the week, and we need them. About two-thirds of us are investing money, but fewer than one in five feel knowledgeable about financial matters. A Commons Committee in Ottawa today will hear accusations that the banks are practicing tied selling. That's when a small business or an individual is told that they must move all business to a certain bank to qualify for a loan or a line of credit. The House of Commons Committee looking into the future of financial institutions will hear from an investment firm CEO and an Aurora accountant. The Canadian Bankers Association appears tomorrow. Getting financing is always one of the biggest struggles for anybody starting a small business with tips on getting your operation off the ground. Here's personal finance expert Linda Leatherdale, who has the tips you need to get started making your dreams becoming reality. The numbers are explosive. Some 2.5 million Canadians are now self-employed in this country, and the number is growing. But if you want to take the plunge, what is the best bet? Buying a franchise, starting from scratch, or buying an existing business? Let's go to a lawyer and find out. If they want to start up a business from scratch, then buying a franchise is not the way to go. If they want to be very independent, then a franchise is not the way to go. However, if they really uh, see a concept that someone else has done and think that they uh, should do that, then a franchise is the way to go sometimes. Larry, the failure rate is very high for small businesses. How can somebody who wants to start out get on the right track right from the beginning? The most important, simplest thing I can tell people to do is do your homework. Uh, any business venture is going to be uh, have some risk associated with it. Read some books, find out whatever you can find out about the business, about the market, about if it's a, a retail business, about the location, uh, market studies. They say that if you want to start a business, you've got to have some capital. But if you need money, where can you go? There are small business loan programs available through the banks guaranteed by the federal government. And uh, most small business actually to finance, leasehold improvements and equipment, that's what they'll rely on. A bank is just not going to lend money to everybody. You need a business plan. You need to have, show, be able to show the banker that uh, you've got a real plan to, 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 to make a business and make it work. Some people even start up a business on the side and keep their full-time job, like lawyer Les Kotzer, who's had great success importing a metal cleaning product. Persistence is very important to an entrepreneur. I find that a lot of people will give up too soon. Doors aren't going to open right away for you. Study after study shows the self-employed are the happiest people. So get your business plan done, go to banks and government offices to find out what programs can help, get startup capital, and do what you love. I'm Linda Leatherdell on Eglinton West for Cable Pulse 24. Time for a short break now, but there's still a lot more ahead here on Cable Pulse 24. When we come back, sports action on the hard court and the tennis court. Welcome back. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sports. Patrick Reynolds joins us now with the highlights. Which Carter's Raptors in tough against the playoff-hungry Magic yesterday at the Dome. Our first look at Alvin Williams in for two here. But the Magic worked it around. Derek Strong bounces off the big O, and it goes. Then Derek Harper for three. Raptors lose 95-68. Indiana was held to 55 points in their loss to San Antonio, the lowest point total since the inception of the shot clock. NCAA Finals, Utah and Kentucky tonight. Fight night in Detroit. Watch Joey Kosher pound Matthew Barnaby. Wings and Sabres, Buffalo pressing, but Chris Osgood comes up with the save. Then Detroit puts this one away. Stevie Y, his second of the game, shorthanded, Wings over the Sabres, 4-2. Leafs host the Kings tonight. 
Marcelos Rios and Andre Agassi in the Lipton Championships in Florida. A good rally here. But Agassi's return is into the net. To match point, and Agassi is long. Rios takes over the number one ranking from Pete Sampras, ending his 182-week reign. I'm Patrick Reynolds, Cable Pulse 24. To entertainment now, one of the new movies to hit the screens this weekend was The Newton Boys. It chronicles the work of one of North America's most successful bank robbing and train robbing gangs of the 1920s. Movie television managed to filch some time with the picture's main attraction, actor Matthew McConaughey. Take two. Well done, guys. Good stuff. And action! Action! Eddie. Here's a bank robbery, and I want all your money. Boys, we fixing to make history. The producers were saying that they had called up to Toronto in researching, and they were asking them, and I said, D -d -d is there, uh, there's a robbery that occurred there in about 1924 or whatever. Did you, where did they pull it? They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're all, yeah, we remember that. That's, yeah, we, but we don't know who did that. We never found out who did it. He said, well, you're about to. What is my government going to do about this bunch? Get off my leg! We're going to put them away. Get off my leg! They were stubborn, that's for damn sure. They were really stubborn. I mean, they, uh, persistent, I guess you guys are. The only part that was damn difficult was, yeah, when we went to Canada. Give me the bag! Hold up! They took the bag very personally. And went, no, I'm not giving you this bag. And they're going, I got a gun on you. It's supposed to be easier than this. Don't you know if I pull a gun, then I can't shoot you, so drop the bag. You're going to be fine. You're not going to get in trouble for it. Just give me the bag. And they didn't understand that. And it was a, it was a tough robbery. We were doing wrong, and everybody else sort of, you know, in, in, in the western side of it, in, in Texas, when we were robbing banks and stuff, sort of gave way, and they didn't at all. Six bandits got away with an estimated $200,000. Hell, maybe 80. And them Canucks are pencil whipping insurance companies just like back home. The last. If you could bring me up, and that'll give you some room to maneuver there, Pluto. Technology enables one to sort of build a, a new telescope every 20 years or so. There's a big upgrade. And so, in fact, that's what's happened in, in the last uh, 20 years or so. The, there have been new technologies that have come along that allowed the development of a new optical system. So the agreement between radio astronomers at Arecibo and Iridium is basically this. It allows about eight hours of viewing every single night. And granted, it's not as good as it used to be, but it's a compromise. And what this does is it helps eliminate the problem that radio astronomers have of radio interference, and it gets in their way of viewing the cosmos. Everything that's electronic is putting out noise. Think about it this way. If you go up to Algonquin Park and you look up at the sky in the visible, you can see beautiful, beautiful stars. You can see nice and deep. You can see the Milky Way gorgeously and everything else. If you try to do that from downtown Toronto, you don't see very much. You can think of the radio spectrum as being done exactly the same way. We're getting rid of all of the uh, visible parts of the radio universe. It took about five years for this agreement to be hammered out because of one specific reason, the frequency. You see, the frequency of 1612 megahertz is really important. And it's for a simple reason. That's the frequency of the molecule hydroxyl. And that molecule is the one that radio astronomers use to help track the evolution of the cosmos. If we could get rid of radio frequency interference, we could do our job much better. Actually, that's true for all of radio astronomy, not just SETI. Um, our technology is slowly closing the window on the universe through which we listen. It's called Outpost, and it's about a young woman, 17 years old, who wakes up in a high-tech prison one day, not knowing how she got there, uh, not knowing the crime that she committed, only that she's been drugged all her life, and that she's got to discover who she is, why she's there, before the, the prison uh, self-destructs.
back from the future here on Earth. Uh, Eric Clapton is dishing out $5 million of his own money for a good cause. He's building a 36-bed rehabilitation center for drug and alcohol addicts on the West Indies island of Antigua. The center will be patterned after the Betty Ford Center. That's your Mega City to the Minute. Your next news and business update is just two minutes and two seconds away here on Cable, 20, Cable Pulse 24, so stay with us. You're watching Cable Pulse 24, Toronto's 24-hour Mega City news source. And welcome back to Cable Pulse 24, your megacity news and business source. Investor eyes will focus on Ottawa today as the House of Commons Committee looking into banking and finance looks at tied selling. Two people will present their case, the banks, uh, that banks are granting loans and lines of credit, but only on the condition that the customer must do other business with the banks as well. We'll be watching this unfold and we'll bring you the latest. This is also the day for an emergency OPEC meeting. Ministers are gathering in Vienna, Austria, to discuss a slash to oil output by 2.3%. The cartel is trying to boost prices, and since announcing the plan, oil has gone up in price by about $2 a barrel in the last nine days. The business world is always stressing that it wants students educated in world-class technology. Today, the Harris government here in Ontario is hoping to expand the science horizons with its new curriculum. Joining me now live is our own Wilson Lee, who will catch up with the education minister later today for the big announcement. Wilson? Thanks, Justin. That's right. At about 1 o'clock this afternoon, Education Minister Dave Johnson will be releasing the science and technology curriculum for the elementary grades, and appropriately, he'll be doing that at the Ontario Science Centre. Um, now, this isn't expected to be a very controversial announcement, but you never know with this government, and certainly you never know what's going to happen in education. So all the stakeholders, uh, teachers, parents, they'll be watching this one very closely because there are a number of issues that they're very concerned about. And what are some of the concerns among those different groups about this curriculum? Well, first of all, if you recall last year, the uh, Harris government uh, introduced the uh, math and English portion to uh, the math and English curriculum for the elementary grades. And at the time, they scheduled about three days of training sessions for teachers problem was they didn't really give teachers enough time to uh, enroll for these training sessions and so there wasn't real adequate training for uh, for the teachers to get up to speed with the training there's also the question of integration next uh, in 1999 the uh, secondary curriculum is going to be uh, contracted from five years to four years so that's going to create a lot of pressure at the grade seven and eight uh, levels for them to uh, catch up so because they'll be dropping the fifth year of, of high school so uh, integration is going to be one big issue. There's also the issue of cohesion because the secondary school curriculum is being, uh, is being revamped outside. So it's, it's being done by a private consortium. So there's an issue of cohesion. Will the grade seven and eight math and science technology uh, curriculum, uh, will that be cohesive with the new secondary curriculum that's being uh, developed outside by a private consortium? Right. Of course, now the other question that this also brings up is the question of money, funding support. The Harris government not known for throwing a great deal of money at education. It's already rejigging programs and cutting funding back in a lot of areas. So what can we expect and what can the schools expect in terms of how they're going to pay for this? Well, and that is going to be the key issue. I mean, uh, funding, as you recall, uh, just last week, the uh, Ontario government released its uh, very confusing funding formula for the education system. Now, science and technology, if, if you actually go back to the, uh, the, uh, the funding formula announcement last week, and you look at the foundation grant, they budgeted $75 for the elementary grades for textbooks, and they budgeted $43 per student for computers. Now, on top of that, they also provided a $50 million one-time grant for textbooks and for computers. So, I mean, it, it's hard to say whether that will be enough to fund the, uh, the new curriculum. So everybody's going to be wa paying very close attention to that. Yeah. Okay, great. That, thank you very much, Wilson. Science students at Dalhousie University may be facing a blow. The Nova Scotia school is about to close because of a faculty strike. But students at St. Mary's are very happy. Two bargaining units there have now ratified new contracts. The workers in question are cleaning and maintenance staff.